Today, we're not just diving into history, we're using it as a crystal ball to peer into the future. The lessons buried in this ancient drama aren't just dusty relics, they're screamingly relevant to the debt mountains we're facing today. Ancient Greece initiated wars financed by debt, saw accelerating inequality and a predatory financial oligarchy, which is eerily reminiscent of today's world. By understanding the mistakes of the Greeks, we can avoid repeating them in our own debt-laden future. This is about busting financial myths, questioning existing dogma, and ensuring we are prepared for what lies ahead. For as we all know, the further you look into the past, the further you see into the future. Unsustainable debt. The national debts of what are commonly referred to as the richest nations in the world are reaching breaking point. In reality, they are the most highly indebted nations of the world. Completely unsustainable and now out of control. Just look at the world's largest economy by GDP, the US. In November 2021, there was a monthly budget deficit of $192 billion, spending at $473 billion and receipts at $281 billion. By November 2023, we see 589 billion spending and receipts at 275 billion, giving a deficit of 314 billion. Thus, over the course of two years, the November monthly deficit has risen by over 63%. Obviously, monthly fiscal positions fluctuate as we can see here, but the trend is clear. Spending, in particular, is out of control. And if we now look at the full year information, we can see that the 12 months ending in September 2022 gave rise to an annual deficit of $1.375 trillion, while the full year to September 2023 saw a deficit amounting to $1.695 trillion over a 23% increase in one year. Obviously, each year's deficit is added to the current debt level, and this is now moving quickly towards $34 trillion. The problem then becomes that the interest on this debt grows exponentially. When the national debt hits $40 trillion, disregarding talk of the actual debt structure, if we simply apply a 4.5% rate of interest, the interest cost alone will amount to $1.8 trillion. If there was a real desire to correct the situation, as was seen in the UK in the post-World War II world, a primary budget surplus would need to be run, where taxation receipts are greater than government expenditure, excluding interest costs. Indeed, in the 1950s and 60s, the UK was largely running primary budget surpluses. In addition, the real interest rate, which is the nominal rate of interest minus the rate of inflation, would need to be kept very low. Post-war UK saw the real interest rate average at around 0.2%. Certainly, inflation will be used to devalue the size of this debt, and then there is the hope that the debt-to-GDP ratio can be controlled by generating economic growth but the demographics of all of the world's richest nations are not supportive as they were in the post-war period. Moreover, spending will continue to rise, and if growth were to rise strongly, bond yields would remain elevated as rates rise. This would happen as investors sell bonds for cyclical growth assets. This would greatly undermine the strategy as a pathway to prosperity and cause the end of this debt super bubble but it may buy some time for authorities, but ultimately the debt is simply unsustainable. The more plausible approach is to try to inflate away the dollar with easy money so as to bring interest rates back down and pay back the debt in devalued dollars. Repaying debt with inflated dollars isn't just sneaky, it's a mask default, and all the world's richest nations have been at it. Nonetheless, a breaking point looms. And so to ancient Greece. Glimpsing into the past together with looking at developments which are already underway tells us where we are heading. And that is certainly for default and economic collapse. But there are five key lessons we can learn from what was seen in ancient Greece as the creditor oligarchy drove the Greek city-states to devastation. Each of the following points build upon one another to ensure that the authorities won't let this crisis go to waste. Crisis acceleration. 
In the economies of Hellenistic societies, Gabrielson describes the Hellenistic period's fiscal shift. The overall share of public borrowing becomes larger at the expense of the share of the tax revenue. Unsurprisingly, as a crisis unfolds, tax takes will fall and borrowing will rise. While the specific scenario of city-states in ancient Greece relying solely on wealthy individual lenders won't happen again in its exact form, the underlying dynamics of relying heavily on debt and the potential power imbalances it creates will still be relevant in the future economic crisis. For in times of crises, governments will resort to borrowing to stimulate the economy or provide relief. Consequently, debt accumulation will accelerate. The next emergency will clearly involve more spending. And if we use 2021 as guidance for that, we can see a deficit in that year alone of over $2.7 trillion. Instead, in the modern world, central banks or international institutions will wield substantial leverage over debt at governments, enabling them enormous influence over policy decisions and economic structures in ways that benefit their interests over the public good. Moreover, it will enable exploitative lending practices. We'll be certain to see some highly unscrupulous practices taking place with regard to asset collateralization in both the public and the private realms as highly indebted households and businesses face the squeeze. Oligarchic predation. Ancient Greece debt crisis wasn't just bad finances, it was a power struggle. Wealthy elites wielding their riches like weapons morphed from creditors to predatory oligarchs, exploiting public finances and enriching themselves with, while democracies crumbled. Citizen power waned as tax systems shifted to loans, handing control to lenders who imposed crippling terms and perpetual debts. Interestingly, perpetual bonds or permanent debt servitude has already been touted way back in 2020 and championed by the BBC. Those that are closest to the source of monetary creation will always fare better as the so-called Cantillon effect takes hold. Named after banker and philosopher Richard Cantillon, who illustrated the distribution of wealth gained from state printed money isn't random it's heavily influenced by the specific institutional arrangements within a society thus rather than uniformly spreading wealth we can expect existing inequalities to be exacerbated substantially and it will be blamed on capitalism rather than the prevailing system of oligarchy greek and asia minor cities suffered recurring debt crises which saw them mortgaging public assets as they faced unsustainable debts. Professor Michael Hudson states in The Collapse of Antiquity that Ephesus and other cities mortgaged their theatres and gymnasia, other buildings and even their walls to pay the indemnities imposed by Sulla, a powerful creditor. Undoubtedly, we will see something similar once again, but it will be corporations who seize such public assets. Meanwhile, the city of Arcosine, facing financial struggles, secured a massive loan from the banker Praxicles, offering an enormously extensive pledge as collateral. Not only every citizens and metics, that is a foreigner residing in Arcosine, possession within the city, but even their foreign assets and property on ships at sea. This arrangement granted Praxicles immense power over Arcosine, exposing both citizens and metics to significant risk while revealing the vital economic role creditors played in the city's financial health. Similarly, in the next collapse, all assets are vulnerable for collateralization. This includes public assets, secured assets, assets on exchanges and in portfolios. As David Rogers Webb comments in his book, The Great Taking, it is now assured that in the implosion of the everything bubble, collateral will be swept up on a vast scale. The plumbing to do this is in place. Legal certainty has been established that the collateral can be taken immediately and without judicial review. 
by entities described in court documents as the protected class, therefore holding cash together with physical assets such as land and property not purchased with debt appears to be vital for what likely lies ahead. For those who have taken such precautions, I believe are well prepared for the lean years that will follow. Social instability and waning confidence in institutions. In ancient Greece, creditors enjoyed the praise of the failing city-states in an effort to minimise social tensions and extend the goodwill of the oligarchy. Hudson states that the best that cities could do was to heap ceremonial praise on wealthy creditors, appealing to their public spirit in the hope they would advance funds on terms less onerous than those typical for commercial loans. This time, governments will engage in collusive exchange with creditors and against the public good. Unquestionably, those creditors rushing to the rescue and offering the solution will receive enormous praise in the mainstream sources. This will likely include central banks, multilateral institutions and certain corporations. This will be maddening for those with eyes to see and ears to hear. A new solution. The perils of debt monetization will ultimately require a new solution. In ancient Greece, Clazomene, a city near Smyrna on the coast of Asia Minor, struck a new iron coin, bearing the same face value as silver and made it legal tender. Instead of directly devaluing its uh, existing silver coinage, a common practice called debasement, they implemented a unique two-step solution. Step one involved the distribution of iron coinage for internal use. The state issued iron coins within their own territory and valued them equal to existing silver coins nominally. This meant that an iron coin had the same buying power as the silver coin within the city. This served two purposes. Firstly, it enabled Clazomene to temporarily withdraw silver coins from circulation and stockpile them. Secondly, it maintained internal trade, as the iron coins kept internal economic activity going while the silver was unavailable. Step two involved the redemption of silver. The state used the collected silver to finance international trade. They promised compensation to the citizens who exchanged their silver for iron coin. The compensation came in the form of interest, which were payments made out of the revenue generated from the silver's use. A gradual repayment was then offered, and the silver was gradually returned to citizens over time. Finally, iron coins were then withdrawn. As the silver was repaid, the iron coins were progressively taken out of circulation and presumably destroyed. This system differed from debasement because the silver's actual value wasn't reduced. Citizens were fully compensated for their iron coins with interest and eventually received their original silver back. The purpose seems to be temporary resource management rather than a permanent devaluation, but yet it provides a fascinating case study. And so as financial institutions collapse, many members of the public will be forced to rely upon explicit government guarantees for their deposits. Guarantees such as the UK's Financial Services Compensation Scheme will likely see the introduction of a new app with a new account provider, your central bank. In return, they'll offer a good rate of interest, perhaps even a stimulus payment, and you'll find your deposit waiting there for you. This example from ancient Greece offers a fascinating insight into the way in which central bank digital currencies may well be introduced in the future. Even Fed insiders currently, such as Neil Kashkari, have said of CBDCs that what actual problem would a CBDC solve? No one can answer that. Problem, reaction, solution. While the iron coins were progressively taken out of circulation and presumably destroyed, this will not happen with the old monetary system. Once the sheep are in the pen, the gate will be firmly closed. Conclusion. There are striking parallels here to what we can sadly expect to see in the coming greater collapse, and it truly is vital that people are aware of what lies ahead and have put plans in place. In ancient Greece, many lost all of their possessions as the predatory creditor class exerted their substantial power. As David Rogers Webb concludes in The Great Taking, 
there has been abundant evidence of great evil at work in the world throughout time and in our present time. Do you really wish to be ignorant of its existence and operation? We cannot afford any willful ignorance. And if you'd like to know more untold economic truths, do check out this video. Now thanks so much for watching. Do consider subscribing and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.